Live from our studios here at Kukumlimli, this is John News Prime with me, Ernest Menu. Our headlines. Airlines cancel flights to Mali as ECOWAS sanctions begin to take effect. Details as Mali's ruler urges ECOWAS to reconsider what it describes as inhuman sanctions. The Social Security and National Insurance Trust Net has adjusted monthly pensions upwards by 10% for 2022. We'll get a reaction from some pensioners. Many of us retired unprepared. We were not given enough education. Whilst we were in active service, we could prepare uh, properly for pension. We want things that can say 20, 25%. Uh, and with just a few hours to go for that crucial meeting between UTAG and the NLC, it's unclear if UTAG will make it to the negotiating table. We are attending events in, in larger numbers than two. So, so what, what, what is it? What is so special about NL, NLC invitation? We will honor the invitation. I'm not too sure whether tomorrow or any other day. We have more as UTAG says they have a very low expectation of the meeting. We're not expecting any meaningful headway so far as this whole uh, impasse is concerned. We are not expecting because we know that NLC most likely will be at it again, just as they have started issuing statements and finding fault with even the processes that we have. Also coming up in business, International Monetary Fund maintains a 6.2% expansion of Ghana's economy for this year, far bigger than the expected 4.7% growth rate it projected last year almost close or even uh, higher than some of the growth rate that was recorded before COVID. And so I think it's slightly ambitious, but it's something that we can achieve if all things uh, stay equal or COVID does not have some adverse impact on our related mm -hmm. growth. We're on DSTV, Channel 421, Go TV 144. Thanks for choosing us. This is your home of independent, fearless, credible journalism. Stay tuned in. Hello again, my name is Ernest Mino. Let's settle for the details now. And airline companies have started cancelling flights to Mali as sanctions imposed by the economic community for West African states, ECOWAS, begin to kick in. Now, ECOWAS leaders on Sunday imposed new sanctions on Mali, including border closures and a trade embargo, saying the military regime delayed to return to civilian rule after the coup, uh, which was totally unacceptable. Uh, joining us via Zoom is international relations expert and former deputy foreign affairs minister, Emmanuel Bombande. Mr. Bombande, we are grateful that you could join us. Uh, what are the likely implications of the situation in Mali on the West African sub-region? Uh, good evening to you and uh, good evening to all your viewers. Basically, uh, what you see happening is one in which we would have all wished could have been avoided. But you are going to see that ECOWAS leaders acted and on the principle of subsidiarity, in which in international relations, the global community now is looking to leaders in regions to take the first step and to now get the compliments of the international community. The ECOWAS decisions of Sunday will expand. And I'm aware that the Security Council today was to have a meeting on Mali. I have not heard of the outcomes yet. And we will hope that in the shortest possible time, the military junta in Mali would begin to engage and respond to the leaders of ECOWAS so that we don't have repercussions of a negative impact of the sanctions on ordinary people. Mm. And, and indeed, that has been the concern of many, that the sanctions could exacerbate the insecurity situation uh, in that country and also triggering a, a spillover effect in other uh, member countries. you agree with this? I agree with it, but I have a different perspective from how other people agree with it. Okay. Whilst I recognize the observation you have made, one thing that people are misrepresenting is to suggest that ECOWAS should not act because if, if it acts, there will be certain replications against civilians. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly what 
Asimi Goita, the Jonathan leader in Mali, is playing on. Because if he truly believes in the plight of his people, then he will take his neighbors seriously and listen to them and engage with them. He ignores his own neighbors, he ignores the regional leaders, and he's engaging elsewhere, and now using the people as a pawn to talk about the inhumane treatment. So in his mind, what is inhumane when he as a leader is not prepared to listen? If you give me one minute, I can make a quick summary of what I mean. Mm, go ahead, sir. He, okay, so in August 2020, he overthrows President Ibrahim Bubakai Keita. What was the premise? The premise was that insecurity was deteriorating. Then, with the same ECOWAS leadership, he allows an interim transitional government only to overthrow that interim transitional government and make himself head of state. So, look at it from August 2020. ECOWAS has played along. They appointed former President Jonathan Goodluck as a special uh, mediator envoy. Then in Accra, 7th November, fast track, the whole of ECOWAS reviewed the security situation in Mali. It had not improved. It was actually getting worse. They insist that put in the timetable that we can all agree to allow elections. He tells them, I'll send you the timetable by January 31st, 2022. Then in December 2021, he organizes a forum that is exclusive of other stakeholders, and that forum endorses him for five more years. That will now make him six years as an unelected leader. Yeah. And the ECOWAS leaders have played along for more than one year. Mm -hmm. Finally, my good brother, I'm holding in my hands the two key ECOWAS principles. Mm -hmm. The ECOWAS leaders in Accra on Sunday did not go out of bounds to do anything illegal. They simply read the text and they said, what has helped West Africa for more, more than 20 years are our protocols and treaties about peace and stability and the sanctions that you see applying, whereas we all wish it did not get to that point, are instruments. And those instruments are the pressures of diplomatic engagement mm. and nothing else. And now that he's saying he's willing to talk with ECOWAS leaders so that they can review the case, it tells you that the sanctions have already worked. Mm. And we hope that that will be sooner than later and people will not suffer the consequences. And that is a very good observation you make because as we are learning tonight, the uh, spokesperson of the military government has made it clear uh, that it will protect the country's sovereignty. And this is in response to ECOWAS's indication that its security force is on standby and could be activated whenever necessary. Now, what is the likely to happen within the corridors of power seeing all these developments? Well, first of all, there will be a lot of diplomatic engagement within, the, within our West Africa region. And that is going to extend internationally. And let me take this opportunity to make some clarifications. I have scanned through different sources of interpretations. It doesn't mean because in Africa we want to be progressive and pan-Africanist and we are against Western interventions in our affairs. We should undermine our own institutions because if we uh, respect what ECOWAS is doing, then we are undermining the sovereignty of Mali, uh, which is supposed to be this progressive uh, pan-African state. They can never be more progressive than our other African states. We have to have this very clear in our mind. Mm. The, the second related to your question is, so from the ECOWAS region to the African Union to the United Nations, there's going to be a lot of diplomatic engagement. Okay. Then there is also going to be a lot of bilateral and multilateral engagements. Keep in mind that UMOA is a multilateral financial institution. Mm -hmm. And once UMOA has cut off, money cannot survive as a government when their final transactions are suspended. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, therefore, we are learning a very important point. Whatever is happening, let's go back to our African wisdom. Okay. You don't ignore your neighbors. You don't bring in a private security company into West Africa. That jeopardizes the security of the entire sub-region. And then you don't care about the repercussions. And that is why when you talk about the 
activation of the equal standby force. If you look, read the communique, ECOWAS is not saying that we are entering Mali with an army to fight the Malian government or its people. Yeah, it ECOWAS is that. saying that we are aware that the decisions we have made can have repercussions in the sub-region. Mm -hmm. In that case, let's be prepared that we do not see those repercussions to go out of hand. And so our standby force should be ready to deal with those replications. Mm. It does not talk about fighting man. And, and that is so. And that yeah. is so, Mr. Bombande. If you could just hold the line for me, because we're joined uh, by your colleague, Professor uh, Kwesienin. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, uh, for joining us here on Join News Prime. Already, uh, terrorism seems, seems to be thriving in, in Mali. Uh, what are the likely repercussions of the sanctions imposed by ECOWAS? Well, look, sanctions regimes <clears throat> are just, you know, superficial interventions and part of a set of tools in the instrument boxes of international organizations to try to bring about behavioral change. The history of sanctions regimes in West Africa have not been very successful. And they only work against very weak regimes or weak countries. You know, so there's a certain hypocrisy in when sanctions are applied by international institutions and to for each particular country. Mm. Because if we look at the processes leading to the Malian crisis, we ought to have applied sanctions regimes even against the democratic regimes in Mali and also in Guinea prior to the coup d'etat. And it is this hypocrisy and our inability to be consistent in the application of the instruments in the toolbox that has now transformed this <laughs> primarily very domestic crisis into a crisis of sovereignty, national sovereignty, pan-Africanism and pride. And for that, I agree with my colleague in the studio, Dr. Bombandi. Okay? Mm -hmm. What is happening now? And for me, I always want to go beyond the Malian case because Mali has become symbolic of the struggle between the forces of evil and the forces of good. If Mali or the international community interventions in Mali fails, and I can tell you the people of Mali really don't care very much about what the international community is doing because the same community kept quiet when it democratic regimes were looting. They know how France has looted their country. They know how other West African leaders have tweaked constitutions, have misbehaved and are misbehaving, and the same people are quiet. Okay, so the people of Mali, I'm talking about the citizens, the general citizens, mm -hmm. tend to have a certain moral apart to say, look, we want to do something different for ourselves. Granted that the steps that we have taken are not right. And you see, when people talk about the Wagner Group, I just laugh. What about executive outcomes? In northeastern Nigeria, mercenary groups have been operating. In Sierra Leone, Guinea, La Côte d'Ivoire. My name knows this. Okay? If mercenary groups operate in West Africa and they are from Western countries, then it is okay. Okay, I mean, I don't know the Wagner Group, and I don't care about what the Wagner Group does. But there must be a certain modicum of ethics in international relations mm -hmm. and the way that we assess the situation. The Wagner Group is not just a fly-by-night group. It is representative of a resurgent Russia and a resurgent Russia that is playing the game in terms of its defense and foreign policy. And the Wagner Group cannot be swatted away like just some tiny fly. So anyone who plays this game about the Wagner Group will destabilize West Africa is not reading the cards well. Mm. Because Russia is playing a long-term game in which it seeks to recapture the spaces that it lost since 1990. Mm. And for Russia also, this is a matter of its pride. 
Okay, so yeah. instead of just reading the Malians that were out, and I like my name's point about you know African traditions and culture being brought in and say that whatever we do, let's listen and look at what our neighbors are doing. But that same African proverb and culture also says that when you go pointing fingers, you should remember four of them are pointing at you. And that in negotiations, and he knows this better because he, was, he played a key role in the Gambia. Mm. In negotiations, we need that ethical higher ground to be able to say, look, pull back from the brink. Okay, what yeah. we are doing is mm. dangerous. The more the Malian regime is pushed, the more Malians are made to feel that their own desires for change and improvement in their living conditions and their contributions to democracy are being trumped by conventions, protocols that are applied haphazardly elsewhere. Mm. Then I think we are opening the door for anger against ECOWAS. And so you would want ECOWAS to uh, hear the plea of the military ruler who says that, uh, you know, ECOWAS must reconsider the sanctions imposed. How, how should ECOWAS do that in the face well, of the, the sanctions, your submission? Look, these sanctions are, are not, <laughs> I mean, they are not going to be effective. Look, it is only going to hit a very tiny elite who will manage to flout it again. Let's not forget that there are companies, businesses, banks whose expertise are sanctioned bastards. Okay? So if Air France doesn't come <coughs> to Bamako, so what? Who loses? 90% of the passengers are Malians. It's Air France that takes the money anyway. You know, so, I mean, the symbolic gestures themselves will contribute to deepening this sense of national identity, national sovereignty, and bringing anger, okay, against the wider international group. Mm. No. But Professor Eni, there's also the perspective of land borders, which is part of the uh, sanctions ECOWAS imposed on money. But you know yourself and I know, the land borders don't work anywhere. Okay? Trade actually thrives better. And in the literature, there's something called attack trade. When you try to restrict people from crossing the boundary, and I think in, in the Ghanaian newspapers and, and on the internet, we know that there's a brick trade across West Africa, even when land borders have been closed because of COVID. So this actually adds another 10 to 15 percent extra cost to goods. It's ordinary people who suffer, who get bitter, who get angry, okay, and who might then want to join groups that can strike against those who have imposed these assets. So I think, I think, that look, having a long-term negotiation strategy in which the janta says five years, the larger ECOWAS community is saying, look, this sends a wrong uh, signal. We all want an inclusive, you know, dialogic political process. You know, five years sends a wrong signal. Let's continue to talk. And I would have thought a year, a year and a half, two years, that will bring them back or will bring Mali back to the democratic, you know, uh, pr uh, process. The roles of Russia and China have changed the equation dramatically. Mm. And I think in going forward, our analysts and strategic thinkers will, will, will need to factor that in terms of the uh, options that they are giving both to ECOWAS and to their respective government. Very well. Pro Professor Enin, I'm grateful for your time. But uh, Mr. Bombande, Professor Enin talks about the implications and talks about uh, you know, how you know, foreign influences has dramatically changed this. We are learning, and also the, the bad signal that this sends, because five years for ECOWAS seems to be uh, long enough. We are learning also tonight that uh, in Guinea, the military junta there has thrown its weight behind uh, the junta in, in Mali. That is not good for the sub region. Uh, first of all, let me appreciate uh, Professor Enin Malgut being when he looks at the antecedents and to express to you, as somebody who has been actively engaged before I came into government, 
I was in the UN office of West Africa in the Sahel in Dakar. And I saw the intensity of diplomatic efforts mm. that should not have allowed Alpha Condé to have a third term. And that should not have allowed Cote d'Ivoire, uh, even when the president there expressed his willingness to leave, to later on change his mind and have a third term. I agree with all those. But at the same time, the worst thing that can happen is to say that because we have not been accountable enough and we have produced the antecedents that created an environment for this stability, we should continue to, if you will call it, be passive. Because then that's the worst thing that can happen to West Africa. And yeah. as we speak, you know that yesterday there was an attempted coup in Burkina Faso. Uh, one Lieutenant Emmanuel Zungrana. I don't know why he's called Emmanuel. Emmanuel don't believe in violence. But Your name's there it. was an attempted coup yesterday. So we would have had a third military regime. And that is why, based on what Professor Enin is saying, we must all agree that ECOWAS leaders can no longer fall into the bad habit that created democratic presidents to sit tight and to change constitutions. And whilst we hold leaders accountable, we must insist that the equals instruments and institutions are applied. That's the first point. Very well. The second point, which you have uh, summarized, the Algerian proposal. Algeria disagrees with the military junta for the time that they want to be in office and suggested maybe one more year. Mm -hmm. But the point is, the military junta has never told ECOWAS realistically what it means. Because ECOWAS is not just talking about a timetable. ECOWAS is also talking about, we will accompany you. And so what you see happening is that there is a culture of military impunity with the Musa Traore regime in Mali, in Mali that the military have gotten so used to, and it exacerbates the, the crisis in Mali that extends beyond Mali. If we allow Asimi Goita, we could be talking 10 years from today of the perpetuation of that impunity of military uh, uh, culture. Then finally, uh, uh, depending on the time that you have. Uh, very le very that... little time. Yes, okay, 30 seconds. There is the remnants of the former Soviet Union republics. Mm -hmm. Their security regime is called CSTO. And in the crisis in Kazakhstan, that was the Russian intervention in Kazakhstan. In the case of Mali, Wagner is a private security company. It is not the Russian Federation. So when we talk about Wagner, let's not equate it to Russia. Wagner, they protect your gold mine and take your gold. And I'm saying this because I know them with my experience, Central Africa Republic. Okay. Last week, they killed 10 people in a village because the young people refused to go and do forced labor for them. Mm. And the human rights abuses are so many that the government of Central Africa is considering withdrawing from the ICC because they have to protect themselves from the abuses of Wagner. So let's separate Wagner from the Russian uh, Federation. The okay. two are different. They only happen to have a connection with the Kremlin, but mm -hmm. they are not Russian Federation. Very well. Uh, Mr. Bombande, we'll leave you here. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, that's uh, Imano Bombande, a former Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister and a senior, a former senior advisor at the UN. Uh, we'll continue to watch the uh, development in Mali because it affects the security of the sub-region. But let's come home now. The Social Security and National Trust, SNIT, Insurance Trust, SNIT, has increased benefits to pensioners by 10%. The amount will affect the lives of about 225,000 active pensioners. Addressing a section of the media at its 2022 indexation, the chief actualist at SNIT, uh, Joe Poku, disclosed that lowest earning pensioners will receive 332 and 48 pesos, uh, and the review was done in consultation with the National Pensions Regulatory Authority, equal to or above the targeted inflation rate for 2022. Who are receiving 300 CDs will now be getting 332 CDs, 48 pesos for this year. Now, for the highest pensioner in 2021, who was receiving 129,979 CDs, not 51 pesos every month. Let me say that that's every month. That's what the SNET uh, pension scheme pays to somebody on the pension payroll. Now, for this year, 
this person is going to receive 142,564 CDs, 97 pesos every month. The scheme is paying somebody this amount every month. Meanwhile, Director General of SNIT, Dr. John Oforitin Kuran, states that the trust remains committed to paying all legitimate benefits accurately and timelessly. We are committed to continue to pay pensions uh, accurately, uh, continuously, and promptly to all those who qualify uh, to receive the SNIT pension. Just so that you know, uh, up until November uh, 2021, which is the 11 calendar month uh, just before we went to spend Christmas, um, we had paid about 3.3 billion Ghana cities, 3.3 billion Ghana cities to uh, pensioners in various forms of uh, pension and uh, associated benefits. And, and that works out to be about three, 300 million Ghana cities a month. 300 million Ghana cities a month. And I know when we do these things, this is a public interest, so there have been people watching us on the internet, uh, people abroad. Uh, 300 million Ghana cities a month is approximately, call it uh, $50 million a month, $50 million US dollars a month that we pay out. Uh, so it's a substantial sum of money that we administer, and we are committed to make sure that we do so uh, transparently and, and, and diligently. Now, some pensioners in OT region have reacted to this. They tell OT region correspondent Peter Senu the, the increase is not enough. Meanwhile, they want education on how to prepare for pension intensified. It isn't. It isn't okay with us. We need more of it to enable us to enable us exist for some time. Because of these things, people die out of uh, frustrations. So we want more for us so that we can live. We want things that say 20, 30, uh, 25 percent. That will, that will be okay for you. That will be okay for you. Though it will not be sufficient, but that is what we think that will carry us a little bit uh, ahead. The um, health status, like I mentioned earlier, due to the health status, and we, we need something like that. And some of us even still have children in school, in tertiary, tertiary uh, institutions. So we need more. They may think that that's the best they can do, but frankly speaking, it's not good at all. It, it won't help us uh, because many of us retired unprepared. Unprepared meaning that we were not given enough education or adequate education so that whilst we were in active service, we could prepare uh, properly for pension. Many of us didn't do that, so we retired uh, with children, some at the primary school, even some at the uh, senior high, and some at the universities. So when uh, the monthly pension comes, you must manage all these in addition to your home maintenance. So my brother, it is not good at all. Uh, we were chatting about this a few uh, weeks ago. Because we were expecting something quite better than the 10% that you are telling me now. Uh, if it can be increased a little bit up to probably 40 or 50%, that will be uh, quite, quite good. Because uh, at present I have uh, two children, one at the... Uh, at Methodist University, <laughs> my brother, it's not easy. So we will appeal to government to probably talk it over with SNIT. If there is something government can do to top up this SNIT thing, because when we say, it, they, they say uh, SNIT is not government, that SNIT is independent of government. So is it impossible for government to assist the SNIT in a way so that what they give us will be a little bit supportive than this sort of thing? Uh, we pensioner, we receive our salary on 2018 that way. 
before we know what is happening. Every year they have been doing something for us. NIT has been doing something for us, little things for us. As at now, uh, I retired about nine years now. My salary has not reached 10, 1,000. So if the government is trying to do something, 10% uh, will not be enough for us. Can do it 40, 30 that way, to be okay for us. 30, 40, 30, that way. Because the, the SNIT money is very small. If we were to go to Cap 30, it's okay. But as, at times, they came and deceived us that Cap 30 is not good. So they put us on SNIT. Actually, we embrace it because when they told us that when you go to SNIT, after some days or some months, you can go for loan. They refused to give us the loan. Even when my boy was in uh, tech, uh, university, I went for student loan, they said no. By that time, too, I was on pension, 2013. So they can do something a little bit for us. We are begging the government. This is John News Prime with me on this minute. Still to come with just a few hours to go for that crucial meeting between UTAC and the NLC. It's unclear if UTAC will make it to the negotiating table. Attending events in, in larger numbers than two. So, so what, what, what is it? What is so special about NL, NLC invitation? We will honor the invitation. I'm not too sure whether tomorrow or any other day. And in business, International Monetary Fund maintains a 6.2% expansion of Ghana's economy for this year, far bigger than the expected 4.7% growth rate it projected last year. Close or even uh, higher than some of the growth rate that was recorded before COVID. And so I think it's slightly ambitious, but it's something that we can achieve if all things uh, stay equal or COVID does not have some adverse impact on our projected mm. growth. It's now time for business. I'm Charles Aitip. The International Monetary Fund is maintaining a 6.2% expansion of the Ghanaian economy for this year. Now, this is far bigger than the expected 4.7% good rate it projected for last year. Charles Nixon Yeboa has more in this report. Although it did not give any reasons for the projected high growth rate for this year, the expected increase in economic activities following easing of COVID-19 restrictions will trigger that, improve aggregate demand and supply, exports as well as government and household spending, will influence the expansion of the economy, which before the COVID-19 pandemic has been growing at a rate of 6% on the average. In its October 2021 World Economic Report, the IMF said Ghana's economy will grow by 6.2% in 2022. This is higher than forecast by many research institutions cited by Joy Business. The higher growth rate indicates that businesses will be able to generate more revenue from sales and expand into the future. The economy grew by 6.6% in the third quarter of last year. According to the Ghana Statistical Service, education, health and social works, information and communication, as well as hotel and restaurant, were some of the major drivers of the growth rate. Meanwhile, partner at the auditing and accounting firm Deloitte Ghana, Yaolati, says the IMS projection is achievable if COVID-19 does not bite hard following the emergence of a new variant. Quite a number of strong indications that obviously uh, of course this projection from the IMS. You would recall that a, a few weeks ago, uh, Ghana has released uh, the growth rate for the third quarter of 2021. The growth rate for the third quarter of 2021 was 6.6%. Proud to that, the first two quarters of the year have recorded a growth rate of 3.1% and 3.9% respectively. So the third quarter of the year grew by about 6.6%. That is that was a remarkable growth. And if that is anything to go by, we expect the last quarter of the year, which we has seen and which saw a lot of or increased economic activity, to also witness some uh, impressive growth. And so if the growth rate in 2021 uh, is anything to go by, then I think that the IMF estimate is not over ambitious. Um, or be, we still have to throw a, a some caution that we are not over the rules as far as COVID is concerned. And so we may not necessarily grow 
at the rate as if we are going before COVID. And uh, the growth rate as estimated by the IMF is almost close or even uh, higher than some of the growth rate that was recorded before COVID. And so I think it's slightly ambitious, but it's something that we can achieve if all things uh, stay equal or COVID does not have some adverse impact on our mm. projected growth. Now, the Bank of Ghana's decision to increase the amount of dollars it plans selling on the forward auction market is yet to impact the market. Joy Business checks indicate that the demand for dollars for businesses over the past week is still on the high side despite this announcement. George Riafi has the rest of the story. For some analysts, it was the expectation that the announcement by the Bank of Ghana should have affected the market in terms of dollar demand. But maybe it appears things are yet to settle based on the assurance coming from the Bank of Ghana. This is because the central bank for the first quarter of this year is increasing the amount of dollars it will be selling on the auction market by $150 million. The regulator is also increasing what will be selling per auction in a month from $25 million to $75 million. This should have brought some market assurance to those businesses that had had concerns with their dollar requests to the Bank of Ghana not being met, especially for those that are participating in the auction market. Others are the view that maybe they are waiting for the first dollar sale this month before the market reacts. It is also expected that this move should help in stabilizing the Ghana city, at least for now, in a year that several projections have forecasted their depreciation for the local currency. You know, some banks say the Ghana said depreciated by 7.1% against the US dollar last year. This is higher than the 3.5% posted in 2020. Some of these bank treasures that Joy Business have spoken to still expect some challenging times for the Ghana city this year. That will be it for business. We have sports coming up. Do stay with us. Hello, good evening and welcome to the sports segment live here on the Joy News Prime with me, Oreko Ampo for Black Stars coach Milo Van Rijevac believes his side has what it takes to win their next two games and reach the knockout stage of the Africa Cup of Nations currently ongoing in Cameroon. Ghana lost 1-0 to Morocco in their opening game on Monday and the Black Stars take on Gabon before their last Group C game against Comoros. The Serbian remains optimistic ahead of the final two crucial games. Ništa, čestitam, čestitam Maroku. Ima dve utakmice. Zadovoljan sam sa igračima, zadovoljan sam sa igrom. Imamo dve utakmice, tako da... Still we have two matches, two additional matches in the group, so we have to concentrate on these matches now, so we can progress from the group stage to the next stage. To znači od psihološki, ali... Psychologically, it would have been better if we at least drew today's match, but of course we have faith in, in our team and we, we hope for the best in the, in the upcoming match. Still on the Africa Cup of Nations, Nigeria got to a promising start uh, thanks to a slender 1-0 victory over Giants Egypt on Tuesday afternoon. Leicester City's Iheanacho scored the game's only goal in the first half. Of Group D action, Sudan are currently playing a 0-0 uh, draw against Equatorial Guinea. Uh, and, and that's how things do stand in Group uh, D. Nigeria picking up... Uh, they are winner, but earlier in Group E action, also Algeria, uh, who are the defending champions, also failed to beat Sierra Leone. That's how we wrap up the sports here. My name is Aurel Kwampofu. And I know you've been waiting for this segment, and she's already here. Hello, Becky. Hello to you, Ernest. Good to have you. Good to have you, too. No funny questions today no just pure entertainment yes all right i trust you on that so <laughs> let's go <laughs> i don't know why you're warning me but let's talk yeah. about Pavi eugene and kitty they have a show in london o2 uh on the 6th of march mm -hmm. this year mm -hmm. and they've been talking about you know the industry as a whole how to project the industry to the rest of the world okay uh, and they, they think that um doing that 
I mean, this is the, the, the start of something. They can't sit around and just, you know, have conversations about, uh, okay, uh, the industry is not moving forward. We're not selling outside the country. Uh, but they have to do something, and this is what uh, they want to do. So all we can do is come together, work together. Charlie, when we all become big, you can decide, that, okay, Miami, Miami, DC. But as we're all now coming, we need to learn from what the others are doing right. You know, instead of fighting, eh, and I think pick like, the good like, things like from you it. Ask, yeah. it needs to be done. Somebody has to do it. Mm. Oh, just, yeah. Maybe it, it would have taken, I mean, some time. But it needed to be done. Mm. We, we can't just sit there and hope that, if not as somebody would do it, Charlie, we too will be people. Mm. So... Once it's been able to be, I mean, some people are, are, are doing it. I mean, we've been in London to support other Nigerian acts before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We were backstage at Mayor Kohn's concert. It was an amazing. We were talking about, wow, when are we having our wedding? We were having plans, actually. We have something like this. And we saw how much uh, um, every, every, most of the Nigerians were backstage trying to gas the guy that, wow, this is amazing. And, and I remember I saved a video on, I saved a video on, on, Instagram mm. of Shopsido, if you know Shopsido, yeah, yeah. after CK's performance on Whiskey's concert, and they were all like, yeah, we are waiting for your concert. Yeah, well, so... Good to have the two of them on that yeah, show. Yeah, And I guess it brings back the issue of, you know, whether or not there was a beef, there were, no, they, they, or it was a stand, because... This, this two, I mean, I mean, they, they have their own differences, but they I mean, they're on, they are on the same point. label, uh, NS, they are on yeah, the same know, label. They are like, you know, beautiful like twins together you should see them well like, they yeah. are good and i love them yeah so yeah. would you be attending the, the, the program yeah i'm sure we're gonna get tickets so Ooh. yeah definitely. so we'll, we'll travel all the way to london yeah we'll <laughs> <laughs> no funny questions uh, let's move away let's talk about uh kofi kinata somebody will say that oh why are you always talking about kofi kinata kofi kinata is good he and we have good. to and we have to all the attention he, he he deserves it so uh, forgive me if we're talking about kofi kenata the rest of the week yeah uh, he's been talking about are uh, you featuring him again on eva he like, is a part two? no yeah there's a part two okay. of i mean it's a whole two-hour conversation okay that you don't want to miss so mm. uh, the first part uh it was aired aired last, last week, week and mm. the second part will be airing this weekend okay. and um, well this is what you should be looking forward to he's been talking about um, why he thinks that he is the you know best songwriter uh, here in, in the country he's I not boasting and, and and I mean so many things he just wants to impact okay that is talent mm. yeah, that is talent before you go to school you you, you have your own talent and sometimes when you are lucky, the school helps you, like the, the school shape you up. Yeah. So I would say that would be talent. And I'm, I'm the type that I wouldn't want to do anything. Like, I just want to be different. Mm. Even if, if people will hate me for that. Yeah, I just want, I don't want to do what everybody is doing. Yeah, so I, I put a whole lot of things into consideration. Look at where I'm coming from, where I took you with you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we, we're not doing bad like that, but we are not there. Yeah. yeah. So, yes. Oh, oh, oh. It makes me feel like if I'm singing, then I have to make sure my music is bringing like hope, to the mm. hopeless comfort, like advising and, and at the same time entertaining because I've seen a lot and I'm still seeing a lot. So yeah. Yeah, I, I don't feel like when I do a song with no content, I feel like I'm wasting, I don't know, I'm wasting my time or I'm wasting oh. the time of the listeners because there are a whole lot of things to be talked about. Like, mm. yeah. All right, Becky, thank you very much for bringing that show. Anytime. And, uh, and we'll next. be watching out for the second, you know, edition Part, of yeah. E Vibes. Oh, yes. And that's it for Showbiz. <laughs>Thanks for staying with us here on Joy News Prime to some other stories now. And it's just a few hours to that crucial meeting between the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG, and the National Labor Commission. But it's unclear if UTAG will make it to the negotiation table. The association called a strike two days ago over their concerns and conditions of service and mainly a failure of stakeholders to uh, stick to an earlier agreement. The NLC says the action of UTAG is surprising since government was already addressing their concerns. But UTAC insists the commission has only acted in the interest of government. That's more in the following report. 
Uh, let's just go in on strike at this particular point in time. For, it's a very unfortunate news for us. Yeah. During the pandemic, we, uh, we were given a short period for, uh, to study a lot of stuff. We wouldn't want that to happen again. Students are already dreading the implications of the action, even though lectures are yet to commence. The academic calendar has previously been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. A quick resolution is all that matters for now. I've been in level 200 for a long time. I can think UTAG would not really stretch it that much and government will respond to them so that we would, uh, the academic calendar will be back on track. The NLC says industrial action is surprising. Ofosua Samoa is executive secretary of the commission. As of last week, I was of the view that things were getting solved because uh, they seem to have agreed on uh, a few things as far back as October and until uh, last week, when one of their very last demands amongst others, that is the access to the labor survey report, was given to them. But UTAC disagrees. Dr. Samuel Bert Boedikusi is president of UCC UTAG. Yeah, let me just correct an impression. Uh, the impression is that uh, we were only interested in the labor market survey, and once we have it, uh, that should be it. I think that that is a wrong one. Um, I think that the uh, NLC boss should look at it again. It is further demanding that the NLC remains impartial. You might have seen in the media um, the boss of the NLC going about making statements that are mostly falsehood. To the effect, so you look at it, it's like their behavior is like they are an appendage of government. And so you are not sure of how fair they would be when they are going to discuss. CEO of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, Ben Arthur, says UTAG must return to the negotiation table. The mechanisms through which you will be able to have better conditions is through negotiation. The wage fixing mechanism that we have in this country is through negotiation. Mm. So when you go on strike, distancing yourself from engagement, mm. how are we able mm. to reach such an agreement? Okay, so, so for it's, for, uh, it's for this reason that we called on National Labor Commission to intervene. Well, UTAC says it does not have confidence in the ability of the NLC to fairly address the issues that have necessitated their strike. Yes, we have received, we have taken note of the invitation. We are talking to our legal, our legal uh, uh, experts on that. We will respond appropriately, but I mean, even, even that in this age and time, I mean, we, we don't talk about because of COVID-19 issues, and people have vaccinated, so, and people are holding events, so why limit attendance to only two? But, 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 as, but COVID, as, COVID is still with us, it's still, the numbers are still very high, don't you yes, think? We, that's, we, that's, we, are, we are not disputing that, I'm, I'm, a health, I'm, a health, I'm a health person, we are not disputing that, but I mean, we, we are attending events in, in larger numbers than two. So, so what, what is it? What is so special about an NLC invitation? I mean, we, we, we can do we can do with more numbers than that. But I mean, as I said, we 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 will honour the invitation. I'm not too sure uh, whether uh, tomorrow or any other day because of the I mean the way we are scattered. But it's important for us to add that yes, we have received the invitation. Uh, we we'll talk to our, our legal brains, and it is our hope that. We'll honor the invitation. So what do you anticipate? What would you like uh, to see tomorrow? What would you like to hear from the NLC as you get into this meeting tomorrow? Well, honestly, we, we don't expect... I mean, the NLC has been at it. That is, how, that is the game they play. I mean, we don't expect any outcome than they say that, uh, I mean, call off your strike and uh, go back to the negotiation table and all that. We don't, we don't expect anything different from that. But, but you see, that, 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 so, so that, in other that, words, that, in other words, just to clarify, you don't expect much from tomorrow's confab. You think it's just going to be another uh, pretentious uh, act from the NLC. That's what you're saying. I mean, I mean, that, that, that is what we know, and I'm sure your guess is as good as mine. You wait till after the meeting, and you see exactly what the outcome will be, right? So uh, the point is that I have heard. I mean, yesterday in the evening, I, I listened to uh, the Fair Wages uh, uh, boss. I mean, talking about the point that the fact that um, review of the labor market survey and review of the energy market premium is a prerogative of the government and all that. Yes, nobody is disputing that. But if it's a prerogative of the government and there's, not, there's nothing to negotiate about, then what, what are you putting us to the table to go and do? Because we, we, we do not have any say. I mean, I can, I can say without any, any doubt that we're not, we're not expecting any any. Uh, meaningful uh, uh, outcome 
I mean, and I use meaningful in, in quotes, not to disrespect anybody, but in terms of making a headway so far as this whole uh, impasse is concerned, we are not expecting because we know that NLC most likely will be at it again, just as they have started issue, issuing statements and finding faults with even the processes that we have. That is what they, the game they have always played. They usually wait and find fault with every labor union that goes on strike. NLC will find fault with them. Meanwhile, they do not police the documents that are agreed to ensure that there is peace, to ensure that the employer also meets its part of the bargain. Now, it, it, it's about mind-boggling mind that the NLC will always do that. Meanwhile, Labour consultant Austin Gambe says government must be transparent in its discussions with UTAC. The employer has a responsibility to engage them now. I'm okay. not talking about tomorrow, today, so that they can understand and appreciate the challenges they have but on condition that they will not be vilified in the, in the public domain the way we have been doing it. They are not, excuse my language, they are not stupid people. They are lecturers. They, they know what to do. And therefore, if we vilify them uh, in public domain the way we sometimes do, as if they don't know, they will get entrenched. And that will make life very difficult for all of us. Right. Let them be spoken, speaking, spoken to, and I can tell you uh, on authority that they will listen. They know what to do. If they have to go back to school, they will go. But if, God, if the employer do not have at all, there is nothing absolutely anybody can do. Dr. Nunu is the national president of UTAC. He joins us on the phone. Doc, uh, has your position been finalized now regarding uh, tomorrow's meeting? Yes, um, we'll be attending that meeting on Thursday as planned. Yes. C come again, sir. Yes, we just closed the next meeting where we took a decision that we are attending the meeting on Thursday. So Thursday will be there. And the meeting has been shifted from Wednesday to Thursday. Very well. So we'll be there. Very well. Uh, and up until now, it, it appears you have an entrenched position on this issue. Essentially, you expect the NLC to tow the government line. Uh, that, the experts say, is not good for negotiations. Uh, how are you approaching this now? Um, our position is not an entrenched one. We believe that it's a direct one, only asking the employer to get certain things done for us. Um, the employer has not said he's unable to do that. Just that the employer keeps shifting his position. In one breath, um, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission tells us that come to the table and let's negotiate. In another breath, he tells you that, no, what you're asking for is non-negotiable. You cannot negotiate it. We decide what to give you. So we are actually having a very flexible position. But unfortunately, it's the employer who has taken um, an entrenched position and not too sure what he, um, he even wants to do. And there was a limitation placed on the representation you could make at that meeting. The NLC says because of COVID restrictions, only two uh, will be allowed into the meeting. Are you okay with that? And, and who is representing you? Um, no, when it comes to representing us, asking for only two, that is not good enough because you look at from our employer side, they have the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, Ministry of Finance, they have, uh, how do we call it, Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, and all of these groups are going to have two representations each. You look at us, and we have 15 campuses, and all 15 campuses normally have representation. So we've actually written to them asking that if they could increase their representation from the original two they gave us to such. So that is what we have written to them officially this afternoon, waiting for their response. Mm. And can we expect that by the end of the meeting Thursday, uh, we should have made some headway as far as this impasse is concerned? Uh, we are hopeful that we will be able to make a headway, but it all depends on the position that uh, will be taken at the table. We're grateful for your time. That's Professor Solomon Nunu, president of UTAC, the national president, joining us on their strike and the meeting with the NLC. Two other stories now. Police officers saddled with medical bills and difficult life as a result of injuries suffered in the line of duty will now have access to financial help from a 1.6 million medical emergency fund unveiled today by President Ikufuado. The fund is part of a three as part of three major projects unveiled earlier today to boost healthcare delivery 
for men in the service. The other two, a new outpatient department, has been opened at the police hospital to ease congestion, plus a virtual medical center to help officers access medical services anywhere in the country. President Ikufuado spoke at the event. I commend the police administration and the management of the police hospital for constructing this new OPD, which will help decongest the existing facility, which hitherto was responsible for seeing to patients with emergency cases, as well as to regular OPD patients. This new OPD, which cost a modest sum of 180,000 CDs, will be dedicated to emergency cases only, in line with best practices. It will ensure a clear line of separation between emergency cases and routine OPD visits, thereby improving the quality of service delivery at the hospital. I'm particularly excited about the establishment of the Virtual Medical Center, the second project I'm commissioning today at this hospital. As most of you may know, since I assumed office some five years ago, one of the obvious successes chalked by, chalked by government has been the execution of the impressive agenda to digitize fully all aspects of our national life. Constructed at an equally modest sum of 50,000 CDs, the Virtual Medical Center, which is an end-to-end -end video hospital management system, will allow patients, no matter where they are located in the country, to undertake virtual consul consultation with healthcare professionals at this hospital. Police personnel, irrespective of their location, can now access health care services from the hospital anywhere in the country at any time. Officers of the service are guaranteed a protected platform for seamless consultations with the doctor. Beginning with virtual OPD attendance through diagnoses, laboratory referrals, prescription of drugs, and subsequent reviews, all of these medical processes can be done without one having to travel from his or her station. Indeed, if the medical situation of a patient demands a higher level of attention, the medical doctor will immediately make the necessary arrangements for the patient to be evacuated to the nearest medical facility for treatment. This virtual medical center the first of its kind in the public sector is indeed worthy of it. I'm delighted to launch the 6.1 million CD Police Emergency Medical Intervention Fund, aimed at providing immediate financial assistance for the medical treatment of police officers who get injured in the line of duty. I've been assured that beneficiaries do not have to go through the usual bureaucratic and the associated del delays which have in the past resulted in some cases in personnel losing their lives whilst awaiting treatment and the deterioration of medical conditions of some others. As we present the first three beneficiaries of the fund, Chief Inspector Victor Anako, Inspector Theresa Ohine, and Corporal Isaac Suman Upoku, with amounts covering the cost of medical treatment in Ghana and abroad, I'm hopeful that all police officers who require medical treatment will receive the best of care without recourse to the cost of treatment. The Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Kufu Dampar, indicates how crucial the fund is, especially to those currently reeling from financial difficulties. To your commitment towards pro the provision of logistics for the service and also ensuring the welfare and the well-being of the personnel of the service. Indeed, history will be very kind to you when tomorrow comes. More importantly, Mr. President, of the three projects that we are here to, you are here to commission for us, the first one is to do with the new 
outpatient department, which in the past was part of the emergency department, giving, making it difficult for the personnel to give the best of their services. Would the decoupling of the normal OPD from the emergency department, we know that the service delivery at this place will improve and become better than before. The second item on, for you to look at, Mr. President, during the commissioning is the, virtual, the police virtual medical center, which has been set up for the purpose of ensuring that police people across the country can assess healthcare from the comfort of their homes, the comfort of their offices, the comfort of their duty point, and the comfort of their villages and towns and cities that they work without necessarily showing up at the police hospital. We know that this project, if it is carried on to the letter, it will help us a lot and make the access to medical care for our personnel very easy and accommodating. The third one, Mr. President, is to do with the launch of police emergency medical intervention fund for providing financing for personnel who sustain injuries or develop one medical condition or the other in the course of performing their duties. And Mr. President, for us to see the significance of this very project, I would like to present to you the first beneficiaries of this fund. And I would like to start with Chief Inspector Victor Mark Anako, who for almost 15 years has been waiting for this opportunity in order to have an artificial leg. He was in an operation at in Samoam. They were called to respond to a crime scene, a robbery crime scene, a bank robbery crime scene at in Samoam, and he was shot by armed robbers in 2007. And Mr. President, the resources to take him out during those years weren't forthcoming. And this gentleman resigned to his fate and never showed up and he was fully or virtually forgotten until today that he's been presented, you will be presenting to him the full cost of his medication in Germany. Mr. President, the second person, in order for us to just look at how important this fund is, is police woman inspector Elizabeth Teresa Ohene, who through job-related sickness became bedridden for so many years, indeed, the issue started in 2014, and she once again has to wait for all these years before being able to also have the facility, the resources to undertake the operations that she needs. Indeed, she is here today because she has gone through the first session of the operation, and the second one is at Focus Medical Center, which is later for later somewhere next month. Mr. President, the third person, Corporal Isaac. Asuman Opon Opoku was somebody who was providing the normal police duties of ensuring police visibility and fighting crime somewhere in Kanishi last year. And he was sandwiched between two vehicles. And we can all say that it is just a miracle that he is still alive with one leg amputated. And he is also going to benefit from this fund. So, Mr. President, this is what you have been doing for us as a service, and we will forever be grateful. But in a spirit of reciprocity, we want to assure you that we will continue, and I mean we will continue with all our might to act professionally, to act humanely, and to act tirelessly in order to ensure that we protect life and property and we maintain law and order. Mobile users are still having a hard time registering their SIM card. The National Communications Authority, in the wake of the public concerns, indicated last week that it was taking immediate steps to decongest registration centers by setting up additional spaces to increase the intake. In spite of these measures, many individuals are complaining of a number of hurdles, which is making it difficult for them to get registered. The registrants are appealing to the authority to and mobile network operators to help resolve the issues to aid a smooth registration process. My colleague Blessed Suga has more in the following report. 
The Ministry of Communications and Digitalization on the 1st of October last year commenced the subscriber identity module registration exercise. As required by the legal instruments governing the process, the regulation mandates network operators or service providers to activate a subscriber identity module only after the subscriber registers the SIM as directed by the National Communications Authority. Team. On this very forum, we indicated that we would commence SIM registration in March 2020. However, due to the pandemic, we were unable to do so. I'm happy to announce that the Ministry and all stakeholders in the sector will launch the National SIM Card Registration Exercise across the country next month in October. The Subscriber Identity Model Registration Regulations 2011 LI 2006 mandates network operators or service providers to activate a subscriber identity module, SIM, only after the subscriber registers the SIM of an individual, certificate of incorporation in the case of a body corporate, or registration in the case of a partnership or an unincorporated body of persons and provide an identification document as well. Only the national ID card, the Ghana card, issued to an individual shall be used for registration of SIM cards of citizens, foreign residents in Ghana and foreigners staying in Ghana for more than 90 days. In the case of foreigners staying in Ghana for less than 90 days, a valid passport or other travel document will be required. This isn't the first attempt to register SIMS, but all previous efforts failed because of the lack of a ver verifiable, secure identification document. With less than two months to the end of the exercise, many mobile users are still raising concerns about long queues and other operational issues that are creating challenges to the smooth rollout of the process. In a bit to address the public concerns, the National Communications Authority announced that it was taking additional measures to create ad hoc centers at lorry terminals, churches, and other public places to decongest other populated areas. However, several days after the directive, the conditions remain unchanged. That many of the registration centers. At first stop, a suburb of Nungwa here in Accra, some of the registrants who spoke to join you say authorities have to act fast to resolve the situation before the deadline. Months, I mean, months that I've been working here, it's very difficult as it is. Everywhere you go, you are very stranded for registering a SIM card, just for a SIM card, wasting a whole lot of days throughout here and it's very frustrated. So we are appealing to the, I mean, the authorities to do something about it. They should have extended the, the days or the numbers that we could have time to do it. Because some people, we are supposed to go to work or do our routine, normal routine. But we are here to stack over here throughout the day and it's wasted. And it's very frustrated. So we are pleading to them because here is the case, the network is not working. I have been here getting to, I mean, two hours now. And still, I'm not hearing anything from the network or whatever it is. So it's becoming frustrating. I was told people are here 3 o'clock dawn and they are numbered, but still some of them are still here before I came to meet them. So just imagine if the network is working now, we that came about two hours or whatever it is, what is going to happen? And it's very, I mean, uh, I mean, there's, there's, it doesn't make sense. So we are, pleading, we are pleading to them to, I mean, do something about the time being or the factor of it so that we'll see what we can do about the, in, this in the chip. I get here 3 o'clock in the... Evening, please. They should help us. Some of them, maybe ne next week I'm going to work. They should help us. The network is no good. I beg. All the time, they should give us enough time so that you can do it. Although the network was functional at the registration center at Osu, registrants also say a lot more needs to be done to deal with congestion at the facility. Around this time, that the time is drawing nearer. There should have been a mechanism. Like you can see that a lot of people are here. I was thinking that a personnel can come outside, set another table so that the registration will move faster. Rather than us queuing here for long hours, I don't even know whether I'll have the patience to wait or I will go and come another time.
Other areas, such as the Vodafone outlet at Circle and the MTN outlet located a few minutes away from the Nima Junction, no, uh, appear to be in order. As we want it. It's fine. And it, this is my first time of coming here. But I've done so much MTN and Vodafone. But that place is also okay. And here it's moving faster than the others. Now, a 65-year-old man has been burned to death at Kronum in the Suame municipality of Ashanti region. Akwesia Sari was sleeping in his room after taking medication when the apartment guarded fire. His brother, who was with him, tried unsuccessfully to rescue after the ceiling of the room caved in. Malik Uku is at the fire scene and here's what he found. The fire started around 5.30 p.m. Monday and lasted for more than three hours. Ten bedrooms out of 15 in the apartment were ravaged and thousands worth of belongings destroyed. Jay Balfour is the son of the deceased. He witnessed the fire outbreak. During the intermittent power cut, a man whom I'm told lived here for a month was cooking in a rice cooker which started the fire. The entire house is completely bent. The late Akwesi Asari has been bedridden for the past three months. His daughter, Joyce Amwako, spoke to Insura News on her last moment with her father. After bathing and giving him food in the morning, he told me he wanted to sleep. Whilst I helped him retire to bed, he whispered to me, Will this suffering end? I replied, God will heal you, so don't despair. I never thought he would die whilst ill because I believed he would be healed. The assembly member of the area, Elvis Nyantechi, says the remains of the deceased is currently at the morgue as they liaise with the police for burial. <laughs> Around 12 a.m., we went out to go and buy some gloves and rubber to cover up my ankle to transfer him to the hospital. According to Elvis, some residents took advantage of the situation to loot. I have lived here all my life. The rooms in here are about 15, out of which nine are completely burnt. When those affected were trying to salvage their items from the char, some looters around also made away with their items. A report by Malik Ewuku read to you. This is John East Prime with me and this minute. We have some more business stories for you after this break. Please stay with us. And business cocoa carriers have suspended their sit-down strike after a week of agitation to demand an increase in their wages and better conditions of service. Cocoa carriers at Tema, Takrade and Kumasi abandoned duty and insisted the 62 pesos they receive per bag they carry should be increased to one city. Although the Cocoa Marketing Company Limited increased the amount to 82 pesos per bag, the carriers rejected it and insisted on the one city per bag demand. Now it appears there's a consensus reached. Take a listen to a report filed in Kumasi. For the haulage of one bag of cocoa, 62 pesos is paid to a carrier. Two days after the sit-down strike, 20 pesos was added to the 62 pesos, but this was rejected by the carriers. However, 
After a series of meetings with management, the Coco Careers have decided to accept the daily 82 pesos wage. Raymond Atanga is chairman of the Coco Careers Association. Came to a resolution that uh, we are citizens of this country and looking at things right now, it's not CMC that is suffering because CMC is not an individual company, but our economy, we are suffering right now because we are bearing a cost that is not bringing profit and then it's going to affect citizens at large and not only Cocoa Board. So we came to understanding that at least we can be considerate uh, to our nation, the motherland, our motherland Ghana, and then continue to do the work with some conditions. They are not paying us, so. they are not even even, even the sister to you, they don't even pay. The Coco careers were worried about the hazardous nature of their work. A number of them exposed to chemicals have been reported ill. Others injured themselves due to the vigorous nature of the work. My dangerous is even dangerous because the bag is 64 kilo and I carry it two times. I have to carry the bag. I have to remove 2,000 bags and they have to sample it, send it to a lab and come back before I will use that 2,000 bags and stack it to like a, to, to like a electricity pool. And even when you reach the house, you can't even sleep. Chemical, chemicals is in the chemicals is even in the coco. They are killing us, and the chemicals is killing us. Let's say 10 of our careers that if you look for more and more so that friendly some of us out to a half round. He said, I brought a few of my colleagues to work here with me, but they couldn't. Mr. Atanga says the government has assured the association of their safety henceforth. Of fact, most of the carriers here, Tema and Takura, they, they use hard drugs to be able to do this work. And as uh, if they continue to use the hard drugs, we all must bear that it won't take long, they will get weak. And because of that, uh, the, uh, the tedious nature of the work and the hard nature of the work, whilst you are taking drugs and doing the work, your system becomes weak. And the moment every little sickness hits us, we our system cannot fight against any sickness again. So the management also said that they will put our health concerns in place. Some of the careers have expressed dissatisfaction with the daily wage. Now it has prompted all careers that we shouldn't depend on carrying cocoa, but when we get the money, we should do other things. So the management of Cocoa Boys should uh, be aware that next time, if they are waiting on us to strike before they will resolve or they will come to our aid, maybe they will not even see anybody here to carry the cocoa. Mona Lisa Frimpon reporting. Meanwhile, Cocoa Board says they will continue to engage with contractors and cocoa carriers to find an amicable solution to the concerns. Here's Head of Public Affairs at Cocoa Board, Fifi Boafo. It is for us to continue to engage and based on that, see how we are able to get an improved conditions of service. Yes, these concerns have been forwarded to management. We'll look at it and then we shall engage them. Are you willing to be there once again? The decision to pay uh, my HR class, they said ability to pay is important. So we'll continue to engage and let them understand where we find ourselves. So we, we believe that we should be able to have an understanding as to whether or not by insisting that a specific amount must be paid is the way to go. We've listened to them. We've looked at the numbers. Based on that, we've had a reasonable adjustment to how much they are asking for. Uh, there are those who believe that it is still too small. But of course, we all have expectations. And we shall engage 
as to whether or not those expectations can be met. Now, the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Programs will be investing 30 million Ghana cities in youth and agriculture. Now, this was disclosed by its Director of Business Support and Policy, Franklin Ozu Karikari, at the launch of the Youth in Innovative Agricultural Support. Agriculture cannot be carried out as business as usual in the context of the fourth industrial revolution to attract the teeming youth of our country. If you look at the global perspective now, the world is changing. Agriculture is also changing. Therefore, we must change to be able to attract the young people who are dynamic in nature. Agriculture is important to the development of any nation, Ghana being no exception. Development must include the youth, and therefore the mission to encourage their participation in the agriculture sector. This effort to change the negative perception of the youth have propelled us to be able to ensure that we encourage them to be part and to participate in agriculture. Therefore, to seek to change this negative perception, the youth have of participating in agriculture as uneducated, unskilled, physical labor with an extremely low economic return must change. Modern agriculture is more than tilling the soil and rearing of animals. The sector today offers career opportunities in research, environment, financial management, engineering, and other technical areas for the youth to explore. There is therefore the need for the introduction of the concept of support for youth in innovative agriculture. That will be all for business, but we'll leave you with international business summaries after which we have sports to stay with us. And welcome to the second part of the sports segment with me, Rick Wampafu, a manager of the former IBF lightweight champion Richard Kome, is unhappy with the Ghana Boxing Authority's demand of a percentage of the Vasily Lomachenko fight pairs. Ghanaian boxers are obliged to pay the GBA a negotiable percentage of their fight pairs, according to Michael Amo Bidiako. The GBA has no right to demand money from his boxer. To be honest, I was a pretty, um, a pretty heated conversation in, in regard to uh, a, a topic uh, in terms of Richard Comey. It's an ongoing topic uh, in terms of, uh, we, uh, I was asked to, in regards to what the GBA wanted to bring in a law or, or try to ask Richard for a percentage of his purse from his last fight, which Richard is not obligated to. There's no rule or regulation that entitles Richard 
to pay the GBA any funding because he, he's not a resident here, he doesn't live here. He pays his commissions and he pays his taxes and everything he does in the US as he has done since 2017. He said to me that if that's the case, then he would not allow Richard to fight under the Ghanaian flag. Wow. How can you tell a Ghanaian not to be a Ghanaian? How can you say that? And I said to him, on what authority do you have to say to Richard that he can't fight under the Ghanaian flag? And I was told I should wait and see. Which, again, was a bit surprising to me that someone who is a president and who's supposed to be a leader and wants people to follow, you're trying to dictate. Nobody likes a dictator. Everybody wants a president to follow and to be respected. So I was a bit taken aback by that. And, uh, you know, and then we left. We left it at that and he told me that I was no longer welcome to work in Ghana. I was no longer welcome to work in Ghanaian boxing and I'm cheating Ghanaian boxing and Ghanaian boxers. Well, if this is cheating Ghanaian boxing and Ghanaian boxing, please tell me what else is anybody else doing? But does, does any president of an association in the country have the right to deny someone his nationality? No, no, not even the president of Ghana. With all due respect, can tell Richard when he enters the ring in the USA, he can't wear a Ghanaian flag. It can't happen. Richard is Ghanaian through and through, and everybody around the world respects Richard for being a Ghanaian. Unlike some people, when they leave Ghana, they forget where they come from, and they try to patronise themselves and try to make out that there's something else. Richard has always maintained that he's Ghanaian, win, lose or draw. He's always held the Ghanaian flag high and made us proud. So to tell somebody, just because you can't get what you want, that they can't fight under the Ghanaian flag, for me, it's, you know, it's disrespectful. Well, still on this controversial issue, let's now get a reaction from the GBA president, Abraham Kote Dikwe. I told Amu Bidiaku about the percentage base. You can see it's 19, uh, 1996. Then the chairman, Nikwe Misa, I was not part of it. But this is a development fee that most boxers pay. All the boxers pay with the exception of those who go and fight in the U.S. So we talked to you. We said, if those who fight in the U.S., like Kombi, we spoke to Dogbe too, and Dogbe said he's going to get back to us. If they don't pay the little percentage that they will give to the Ghana Boxing Authority, how then do we de develop the sport? Mm. Uh, before we go on, President, I want to clarify what the determined percentage is. Um, it's not specified in the rule book. It's, it's a determined percentage. Yes. So it, it, it how is, much? It what, is a negotiable. Okay. Which, so in this case, yes. how much was he supposed to pay from uh, the Lomachenko fight? Which perhaps that is what we could have sit down with him. Okay. Because with those that fight locally, pay five percent. Okay. But we are not putting the five percent on the world champion who are made the law. It can be within three percent to one percent. Okay just to devo help develop the sport. Okay. So this is what we were asking. We were discussing, joining with Amu Bidiakun. So I don't know how uh, Kome got the whole thing. I personally have not spoken to Kome. I have not seen him since he came down. He has not been in the GBA. So for him coming to insult the entire GBA, the ministry and the, the, the Ghana Boxing Authority, for me, I think it's below the... Well, that's how we're wrapping up the sports, but just a little update before we go. Sudan and Guinea-Bissau ended in a nil nil draw. So essentially, Nigeria ended the day on top of Group D after beating Egypt by one goal to nil in the ongoing Africa Cup of Nations. If you want more updates on the tournament, you can check my draw online for S last sports or follow us on social media at joysportsgh. My name is Uriq Wampofo. And that's our show for tonight. Many thanks for your company. Please log on to myjoyonline.com. You find many stories there. Um, and that's